good day. So, today in this lecture we will start our discussion on another very important technology namely uh, asynchronous transfer mode or ATM. Okay. <coughs> so, this ATM uh, was originally envisioned as a sort of um, technology which will sort of uh, solve all problems that means, it will be in the LAN, it will be in the VAN, uh, it will be uh, it will be give, give very good quality of service. So, it had a very ambitious plan. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, it did not quite work out that way uh, the reason being uh, that first of all the standardization took a lot of time and uh, the and uh, you know when everybody people from the computer world, people from the communication world when a lot of people start discussing things and uh, come up with a standard, the standard became very complex alright. And the one uh, implication of the standard being complex was that um, <coughs> the cost became uh, quite high alright. So, although it did debut and uh, work in some uh, local area networks, but slowly now it has been replaced in the local area network mostly, but still it is a very strong and important technology in the wide area network. So, ATM remains uh, in operation in a lot of places uh, today and it is going to remain in operation for quite some time and we will just uh, look into this. So, ATM was asynchronous transfer mode. Why ATM networks as I said driven by the integration of services that means, uh, all this integration of voice data everything will come into the same kind of network that was the vision performance requirements of both telephony and data networking. So, this was called broadband integrated service vision or BISDN. Telephone network support a single uh, quality of service and is expensive to boot. Internet supports no quality of service, but is flexible and cheap. So, we wanted to have the best of both worlds so, that means, uh, that means it, it will have quality of service, but uh, hopefully it would be less expensive and so on. ATM networks were meant to support a range of service qualities at a reasonable cost. So, intended to subsume both telephone network and the internet. The cost and complexity turned out to be high and quite possibly IP will fill the above role. That means, this is the <coughs> IP based technology is going to fill the above role, but still as I said that in many service providers ATM is still uh, there and people are also deploying ATM networks even today. Uh, so, this is going to remain for quite some time. So, for a brief history of ATM, we will just go quickly up to this that means, um, so 1980s a packet research uh, packet uh, research begins and 1986 uh, it uh, adopts approach for BISDN. Then in 1989, so it uh, you see it took 3 years to decide that finally, they will have a 53 byte cell which is a rather small uh, value, but uh, I mean here the communication people wanted a small value and the data people wanted the, the computer people wanted a large value and there was a moral fight and all that. So, that fight really went on. In 1991 uh, the ATM forum was set up and 92 ATM forum issued its first spec. So, it you see it took quite a number of years. 1993 ATM forum adds uh, user committees and 96 ATM forum approves the uh, anchorage accord. So, 1996 onwards death of ATM in the enterprise uh, and but rollouts in the carrier networks. So, as I said that this is still very important today. So, it, the, the basic points of ATM that it transmit all information in small fixed size packets called cells. Okay. So, if uh, uh, they were made fixed size, so that uh, switch design becomes easier and you can scale to high speed. Cells are transmitted asynchronously, that means this is uh, basically our um, statistical uh, multiplexing when we talked about TDM, we said that uh, because one of the advantages of packet networks is that it was more efficient in terms of uh, bandwidth utilization, whereas a uh, circuit switch network. Uh, was uh, less efficient because when the when nothing is uh, moving in that uh, circuit, the circuit is remaining idle. So, that is wasted bandwidth. So, 
ATM tried to address that using statistical multiplexing that means we will have fixed uh, uh, size cells and they can be pushed uh, and these cells can be pushed in in any uh, order by the end stations. But the network will be connection oriented this was necessary in order to accommodate the uh, hmm, quality of service which everybody thought and still uh, people think about that today that it is uh, very important. So, this is asynchronous unlike SDH which is a synchronous system and this is, but this is connection oriented nevertheless. Each cell is 53 bytes long, 5 bytes header and 48 bytes of payload. So, it is a 5 byte very small header and 48 bytes of payload. Making an ATM call requires first sending a message to set up a connection subsequently all cells follow the same path to the destination. So, this is just like circuit switching once first of all you have to set up a connection only thing is that here the connection that is set up is not um, a physical connection, but they are virtual circuits in the sense that first of all you find the path and then along the path all the ATM switches etcetera they would reserve some resources for your connection and this reservation of, of the resources uh, in all the nodes along the way that constitute the uh, virtual circuit all right. So, this resource uh, will be reserved and all the uh, cells would flow through this same one path. So, this is a uh, connection oriented system, uh, but uh, cell switched. Uh, rather than a pure connection oriented systems so that to get better efficiency. It can handle both constant now once you can get a connection oriented system. Um, um, so, you can have different uh, quality of service. So, you can get constant rate traffic and variable rate traffic thus it can carry multiple types of traffic with end to end quality of service. ATM is independent of transmission medium. So, as we will see later that it a uh, lot of different transmission media are possible it does not prescribe any particular rule. They may be sent on a wire or fiber by themselves or they may also be packaged inside the payload of other carrier systems and uh, this is a, a very interesting uh, situation in the sense that for example, when you are uh, carrying just ATM traffic in between you have a WAN segment where you have SDH. Now, your ATM can these ATM cells can be pushed into some SDH container and sent along all right. And as a matter of fact the other thing is also possible suppose there is some SDH traffic which is coming in now you can now and in between there is an ATM link. So, what you could do is that um, these VCs can then take some constant bit rate service uh, high class of service like a leased line kind of thing on an ATM link. So, uh, ATM sitting on SDH that is possible SDH sitting on ATM that is also possible uh, and ATM by itself can be used as a transport network. So, as I said that the carriers or the service providers in their backbone uh, they have employed a lot of ATM. So, it is still uh, living over there although from the LAN it has or from the enterprise network it has sort of uh, gone out uh, right now. The delivery of packets is not guaranteed, but the order is that means they do not know since this is a, a sort of circuit oriented or, or it uh, sets a virtual circuits. So, the order of the cells will remain the same. So, that uh, the higher layer cells need not uh, worry. This is just an example for example, IBM suggested a 25 Mbps for ATM NICs for taking it to the desktop it uh, did not survive ok. And one of the reasons why uh, ATM in the desktops did not survive uh, I mean one reason I mentioned is the cost ok. So, it was more costly ok the ATM NICs were more costly the ATM switches are also much more costly than ordinary say Ethernet switches that was one side of the story. The other th other thing was that even if you have ATM, but you did not have software all the so most of the software were developed based on IP ok. Um, so, uh, in with an ATM if you want to have the vision of all ATM networks did not materialize one of the reason was that all the softwares were based on IP ok. So, people were not ready to move all I mean it was not really possible to move all that software uh, into uh, ATM uh, just like that ok that would uh, 
been a tremendous amount of cost. And since the market did not expand as expected, uh, so the cost remained high for quite some time. So, that was the um, difficulty of uh, this approach. So, much of the ATM devices operated at 155 Mbps that is OC3 or higher and 1622 Mbps that is OC12 speeds. The standardization process took too long and the resulting technology was too complex meaning costly to remain in the cutting edge. So, the basic ATM concepts are that it sets up virtual circuits, it uses fixed size packets or cells so which allows hard uh, fast hardware switching, small packet size, statistical multiplexing, integrated services that means different qualities of services can uh, coexist in the same time good management and traffic engineering features. So, we will look a little bit uh, of these in the next lecture, scalability in speed and network size. So, these are the basic ATM concepts. ATM applications could be ATM deployments in frame relay backbone. So, frame relay is uh, was one kind of wide area network connectivity which is now sort of slowly going out. Previous to frame relay we had x.25 and even slower um, WAN technology. Uh, once again, we will not have time to discuss X25 and frame relay, but they are sort of connectivity, they gave connectivities to backbones. Uh, so, ATM could be deployed there, internet backbones, as I said, aggregating residential broadband networks, cable, DSL, ISDN, etcetera, they can feed into an ATM switch and then get uh, transported. Carrier infrastructure for the telephone and private line networks. So, this is one area where it is still going strong. So, the failed market test of uh, ATM were the ATM work group and campus networks, ATM enterprise network consolidation and end to end ATM. This did not happen because of software and these did not uh, take, uh, take off because of uh, cost. So, just uh, this thing about the synchronous that is the telephone networks and uh, ATM. So, Telephone networks are synchronous, okay, we know that because this 125 microsecond is the uh, frame rate which is very sacrosanct in that world. ATM is asynchronous transfer mode. So, phone networks use circuit switching, ATM networks using packet or cell switching with virtual circuits. Okay. So, this is a uh, the, so, the cells I mean in a, in a telephone network uh, cells from a party are, are a, um, information or payload from a particular source will come periodically like this, whereas here it can come with any time it uh, the line is free. In telephone networks all rates are multiple of 64 kbps, with ATM service you can get any rate and you can vary your rate with time, because now you can program what kind of rate you will uh, require. So, uh, maybe uh, you have a data service which does not require, I mean you require constant bit rate service, okay. but instead of 64 kbps service maybe you want 10 kbps service. Okay. So, it is possible to have a virtual circuit which is uh, where the reservation of resources would be uh, in that fashion that okay, I will use a 10 kbps uh, constant bit rate kind of service. With current phone networks, all high speed circuits are manually set up. ATM allows dialing any speed and rapid provisioning. So, since this is done uh, through software and signaling, uh, so ATM allows this. So, this is the advantage. So, uh, so far as telephone networks is concerned, this is a, a lot of advantage of ATM uh, in the that means in the backbone side uh, in ATM over the uh, traditional <coughs> this thing. So, that is why a lot of ATM has been deployed over there. Just to compare ATM versus data networks, ATM is virtual circuit based, the path and optionally resources on the path is reserved before transmission. IP on the other hand is connectionless and end to end resource reservation not possible directly. Okay. Indirectly people are still trying to do that, because quality of service remains an important issue. RSVP is a new signaling protocol in this IP domain in the internet which tries to res, uh, reserve resources. There are other ways to do that and one thing which is becoming quite popular namely MPLS. So, we will talk about MPLS in a different lecture. ATM cells are as I said fixed and small size trade off between voice and data. Uh, so, IP packets are of variable size. ATM provides QoS uh, coupled to signaling that is that the say ATM signaling is called 
uh, PNNI one part of it. So, we will talk about PNNI later on in the next lecture, but whereas internet provides best effort kind of uh, uh, service. For addressing ATM uses a 20 byte global NSAP uh, addresses for signaling and 32 bit locally assigned labels in cells. So, uh, actually when we are talking about ATM there are uh, first of all two kinds of uh, addresses we are talking about all right. One is the ATM address which is a 20 byte, 20 byte you know is 160 bits which is a huge address ok. Even 6 uh, byte uh, MAC addresses was give you a large address space, 20 byte of course gives you a very large address space. <coughs> And this address space is divided in some way when we talk in details about these ATM addresses we will talk about this there are different schemes of addresses which uh, people try to subsume in this ATM addressing. So, that is one kind of ATM address. The other thing is that once a path has been set up. So, for setting up a path you require this 20 byte address, but once a path has been set up you do not require this address any longer because the path has been set up. Only thing is that since this is a virtual path in between uh, when a node gets a cell it must know that this is just belong to this particular virtual circuit all right. So, we have to have some kind of virtual circuit identifier ok. So, that is a smaller uh, much smaller address. Uh, so, that is another address. So, we will talk about that. ATM offers sophisticated traffic management this was one of the strong points of ATM and still remains a strong point in ATM. And TCP IP congestion control is packet loss based whether a packet is lost or not, but ATM gives much more sophisticated QoS. So, for fixed size packets the why they were uh, this thing we have already talked about it, it is simpler buffer hardware these are the advantages of having uh, small fixed size packets, packet arrival and departure requires us to manage fixed buffer sizes and simpler line scheduling each cell takes a constant chunk of bandwidth to transmit and easier to build large parallel packet switches. So, these are the advantages. The disadvantage is that overhead for sending small amounts of data at the same time that means for each cell you have to have this 5 byte header and only 48 byte uh, so uh, 10 percent is uh, um, already gone uh, on your uh, just uh, the header uh, and if you have a large uh, the amount of data to send may be several megabytes and all. Uh, so, you need a lot of cells. So, the overhead become may be become important and then this large uh, pa frame which you wanted to send they have to be broken up into this small cell that is one part of the story and the other uh, on, on the receiving side you will have to put these cells together to form the original large frame. So, uh, this segmentation on one side and reassembly on the other side that uh, headache or that uh, overhead will also come in and naturally the cost will also come in. And last unfilled cells after segmentation wastes bandwidth this is not too much of a point. So, um, uh, the smaller the cell the less an endpoint has to wait to uh, fill it. So, low packet uh, packetization delay the smaller the packet larger the head, uh, header over it this is what we talked about. Standards body balance the two to prescribe 48 bytes plus 5 bytes which is 53 bytes all right. So, about efficient maximum efficiency could be about only 90 percent. Now, let us talk about the ATM layers. Uh, first I will I mean today we were uh, uh, you know that uh, as I said that this was done by a big committee where people were fighting. Uh, so, naturally uh, the ultimate result of the was that the ATM um, protocol and it is all the layers etcetera which are involved is quite complex all right. Actually instead of uh, the like the two dimensional kind of protocol stack that I showed you for either the OSI protocol stack or the TCP IP protocol stack in the first uh, class for ATM this is a three dimensional figure. So, which uh, maybe I will show you later, uh, but we will just uh, talk about the some of the uh, important sub layers uh, in that uh, on the um, on, on one side ok. As I said that this is a three dimensional on the control and management side there are a number of them and on this data side there are a number of them. So, we are just talking about the ATM layers on this side. 
one is a CS which is the convergence sub layer and SAR which is the segmentation and reassembly sub layer. So, these two layers together is the ATM adaptation layer or so called AAL and that uh, <coughs> there are different kinds of ALs uh, AL 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 etcetera, but they all have this uh, two sub layers convergence sub layer and segmentation and reassembly sub layer. Then we have the ATM layer. Okay. This is uh, somewhat in between a data link layer and a network layer and then there is a transmission convergence sub layer uh, that means the transmission will come and sort of will be uh, put back and physical medium dependent sub layer that is the PMD. So, these two uh, sub layers together will be the physical uh, layer. So, if you look at this you have the AL that means the ATM adaptation layer, the ATM layer and the physical layer. ATM adaptation layer uh, consists of two parts and the ATM adaptation layer, ATM layer and the physical layer. One is the convergence uh, uh, that means uh, <coughs> sub layer and the segmentation and reassembly SAR. Uh, and the physical sub layer is transmission convergence sub layer TC and the PMD which is the physical uh, medium dependent sub layer. So, we have the physical layer, ATM layer and ATM adaptation layer. As I said that this is a very simplistic view of the ATM layers and uh, there are other layers uh, for control and management function we will come to that later on. So, there is an end system two if, if two end systems are communicating from the ATM adaptation layer, the ATM adaptation layer will really uh, communicate with the other parts higher layers of the software over here. So, it will come through this AL physical layer then go only up to the ATM layer here and then just go up on the other side. So, this is how the stack looks like at least a simple view of it. Adaptation why did we call it ATM adaptation layer AL adaptation mapping of applications for example, voice data etcetera to ATM cells all right. And physical layer could be uh, uh, sonnet etcetera if it is using a sonnet or it could uh, simply be um, uh, uh, maybe uh, some uh, DWDM system. ATM layer uh, um, uh, sort of handles transmission switching reception congestion control, uh, cell header processing, sequential delivery etcetera. So, this is the done by the ATM layer in between. Now, we look at the um, layers one by one. The top one that is the top sub layer of the AAL uh, ATM adaptation layer is the convergence sub layer. It offers different kinds of services to different applications. All right. So, that is why it says it converges over here or different types of uh, services uh, are were supposed to converge and all of them supposed to do ATM. So, for convergence we put an uh, this uh, ATM adaptation uh, layer. Uh, so, for some for example, may be a voice channel I require a constant bit rate traffic may be all right. Similarly, for a data I may require some other kind of traffic. So, different classes of services were defined uh, depending on what kind of AL 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 etcetera different classes of service were defined and the convergence sub layer really uh, sort of negotiated that and came to a bandwidth contract and all these other kinds of contract. So, one was the CBR which is the constant bit rate or bandwidth guarantee and suitable for real time traffic. ABR is for available bit rate suitable for busty traffic and feedback uh, about congestion and uh, UBR which is unspecified bit rate it is the cheapest on all and suit may be suitable for busty traffic may be data traffic. Provides a specific AL service at an AL network uh, service access point okay. that is NSAP and NSAP by the way I will be using this term which is called network service access point. So, this was the job of the convergence sub layer and the other sub layer in that AL was the segmentation and reassembly sub layer. Segments higher level user data into 48 byte cells at the sending node and reassemble cells at the receiving node. This sub layer usually implemented with ASICs. Now, this has to be done very fast because we I mean one of the another reason why ATM was envisioned as a system which will really scale to very high speed. So, the and the cell has to be the segmentation and reassembly has to be done very fast. So, usually it is done with the help of an ASIC that is an application specific IC for doing the segmentation and reassembly. It tears down messages passed from the upper layer and converts them to cells. 
Some padding may be necessary to make it a multiple of 48 bytes at the destination the stream of cells are reassembled. So, these are the different array types L 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 which gives different classes of service class A, class B, class C or D and class C or D. Class A is connection oriented CBR, uh, uh, class B is uh, connection oriented VBR, uh, class C or D may be connection oriented VBR, there is L34 may be connection oriented VBR or connection less VBR. Okay. And this is a simple and efficient adaptation layer, these are a little uh, complex. Uh, by the way, all these L's uh, since um, ATM um, sort of got cornered into the service providers backbone, okay, uh, many of these L's etcetera were never widely deployed that was one point I must admit. So, the classes of service just uh, mentioned some time back. Uh, was um, the convergence sublayer. The CS interprets the type and format of incoming information based on 1 to 4 classes. Class A was constant bit rate, it is connection oriented, strict timing relationship between source and destination. So, if you require that kind of which is very sensitive to the quality of service like voice, video, etcetera, uh, you can have a class A service. Of course, class A service would be more costly. Class B is variable bit rate this is again connection oriented strict timing for example, uh, packet mode video for video conferencing. Okay, so, it is a variable uh, bit service. Class C is connection oriented VBR all right, not strict timing. So, there is a slight difference between class B and class C <coughs> for example, LAN data transfer uh, applications and class D is connection less VBR not strict timing for example, LAN data transfer applications such as IP. Okay. I mean for example, if it is uh, frame relay then the person who had taken this uh, frame relay uh, service had some uh, original negotiation about the speed. So, uh, so class so it has to be a little better than class D, uh, but not all the way to class A or B. And specifically L 5 I mentioned out of all those because L 5 it was introduced for data services. It supports both message mode and stream mode. In the message mode, a packet of length up to 65 kilobyte may be passed to the AL layer to have it delivered to the destination either on a guaranteed or best effort basis. So, ABR source the available bit rate source follows network feedback. So, here network gives some feedback and later on in the next lecture we will just show how. Uh, I mean this is just to give you an idea about how quality of service is uh, handled in ATM because uh, a lot of things which were learned uh, in ATM are also employed today in some other guys uh, maybe in MPLS or some kind of very new uh, IP technology. So, how quality of service can be guaranteed this was and still remains a very very important issue in networking today because as we are people are talking about convergence of voice, data, video everything into the same network, but for some of these namely voice, video etcetera we require some guarantee about the quality of service uh, that means uh, I mean uh, just uh, whatever happens um, in the pure data network where there may be a lot of delay, lot of jitter etcetera that may not be acceptable for this kind of service. So, for convergence quality of service is important and uh, ATM really tried to do a very good job in quality of service uh, so and a lot of good lessons were learnt over there. Unspecified bit rate is of course, the cheapest of the lot. So, user sends whenever it wants no feedback, no guarantee cells may be dropped during congestion. So, if there is a congestion in between uh, the UBR cells should simply be dropped. CBR is of course, user declares required rate and he is ready to pay for it. Throughput delay and delay variation these are guaranteed and VBR uh, declare average and maximum rate okay. and this has got two different this thing. One is that real time VBR for voice etcetera in conferencing and non real time uh, VBR for stored video not video conferencing, but stored video. So, just uh, uh, an, uh, this thing 
for for available bit rate the q is in the source okay because uh, the source really takes the feedback from the network and adjusts the rate uh, whereas in ubr the q is in the network if the q gets full it gets dropped pushes congestion to the edges so that was one good thing there is no back pressure because if there is pressure the ubr will be dropped good if end to end atm um, and this is the same as uh, whether in the atm to uh, backbone okay and this is very fair and good for the provider uh, ubr is of course simple for the user there is also a concept of guaranteed frame rate which is an ubr with a minimum cell rate so this is a minimum cell rate it will try to guarantee but beyond that it is ubr that means unspecified bit rate so this is a frame based service or guaranteed frame rate so it's a frame based service complete frames are accepted or discarded into the in the switch traffic shaping is frame based all cells of the frame have the same cell loss priority <coughs> whether they are inside the mcr or not all frames below mcr are given clp is equal to zero service all frames above mcr are given best effort clp is, that is clp equal to one service Okay, having talked about the different types of quality of service that is available in ATM, next let us look at the ATM layer and then we will look at the data link layer of ATM uh, today. Uh, in the next lecture, we will be talking about uh, routing in ATM, how uh, so what kind of addresses it use, how it does routing. We will look a little bit more uh, into the details of how a few classes of service are uh, this thing. Uh, are accepted etc. Uh, I mean classes of service are handled uh, that is in the next lecture. Also in the next lecture we will talk about since as I said that most of the software uh, which is uh, there uh, in the world they are happen to be on IP. So, somehow integrating IP and ATM was an important uh, issue. So, how that was handled that will also I will talk about that. So, in ATM layer this layer is akin to the network layer of OSI although it has data link layer characteristics as I said that this is somewhere in between network layer and data link layer. ATM uses globally unique addresses using that NSAP format of ISO this is used for setting up connections path and circuit identifiers are used once a connection is established. So, uh, so, these are the ATM interfaces a lot of interfaces were uh, different types of interfaces were uh, designated in the standards. One is the computer connecting to a private switch ok. First of all there is a hierarchy of switches public private switches public switches etcetera I will show you that later on. But a computer uh, your computer let us say in the LAN may be connecting to a private ATM switch. So, for this there is a private UNI or private user network interface. Similarly, there when a private switch connects to a public switch there is a public UNI there is a public user network interface and public switches uh, sort of talk to each other using this interface called NNI that means network network interface and then there are private UNI. So, there is all kinds of different interfaces so we will not have time to go into the all the details UNI is the user network interface, NNI is the network uh, node interface private and as well as public. So, that makes it PNNI, BISI is broadband intercarrier interface between two carriers. So, if there are two carriers, two different carriers, so there is a ISI intercarrier interface defined for that and DXI is data exchange interface. So, there is a data ex exchange interface with a router etcetera. So, different uh, interfaces were defined, uh, some of them uh, may not be even fully defined uh, because it was not very widely deployed. And as I said that there are a hierarchy of switches uh, there is a first of all there is in the carrier you have the carrier backbone switches then the carrier edge switches then the enterprise switches which talk to the carrier edge switches then the LAN uh, or campus backbone switches and the work group switches. So, these are uh, these are all in the customer premise whereas, this is all in the service providers premise or central office ok. So, there is a hierarchy of switches in ATM 
uh, actually the hierarchy of switches they are all basically ATM switches only thing is that their interfaces will be different. So, some of the software and how the protocol that is going on in these links they will be diff different depending on uh, where that switch is. So, where that switch is in the hierarchy. Okay. <coughs> So, for physical layer functions transports ATM cells on a communication channel and defines mechanical specs connectors etcetera. So, there are two sub layers one is the PMD or physical medium dependent sub layer medium dependent functions like bit transfer, bit alignment, uh, optical electrical, optical uh, OEO or uh, functions etcetera. And then there is a transmission convergence sub layer maps cells into physical layer frame format like it may be DS1 or STS3 on transmit or it may be uh, some wavelength etcetera. It generates HEC on transmit uh, that means, it generates uh, this HEC is the header of a cell header actually for, tra for transmission it generates idle cells for cell rate decoupling or speed matching for uh, matching speed. Uh, so, this has to so that in the transmission layer. So, this it has to do depending on what kind of transport it is using. Uh, so, all this speed matching etcetera has to be done. So, that is why this sub layer is called transmission convergence sub layer. As I said that uh, no particular uh, medium was specified for ATM. So, this was uh, uh, left open. So, many things are possible starting from multimode fiber um, 155 Mbps sonnet STS 3 C or 155 Mbps etcetera single mode fiber plastic optical fiber shielded twisted pair coaxial unshielded twisted pair UTP 3, UTP 5, DS 1, DS 3. So, you see so whole lot of things are possible. But uh, what finally happened was that serious actually serious attempt was made to interoperate with several L, uh, layer 1, layer 2 and L 3 technologies. However, since ATM survived only in the service providers backbone and at the edge uh, fiber and that two single mode fiber remains the most important medium today. And just uh, this I mentioned earlier, but uh, just to uh, mention it once again and uh, that ATM sonnet mapping how it is done uh, because ATM may finally, get carried by a sonnet transport uh, at some point in the van that is quite uh, good and easy because if you remember our discussion about sonnet that there is a uh, pointer to the beginning of the uh, payload. So, so the, this payload can actually be anywhere in this uh, uh, um, uh, frame except I mean the payload where the it is for the payload area forget about that <coughs> that uh, overhead sections etcetera that we discussed in detail in sonnet. So, these cells are sort of packed in it. So, cells are mapped row wise into the frame and cells could contain data or be empty depending I mean it could be empty because uh, uh, for some rate matching some empty cells might have been put over there. So, cells are mapped row wise this is the point and since ATM is coming at a particular rate etcetera depending on what rate it is. Um, uh, so, uh, ATM could take I mean uh, the uh, an ATM switch which is connecting to an uh, next uh, how this thing would be an SDH transport all right. But ATM you remember ATM has to give some guarantee because that is how it is looking at the sort of user end ATM has to give some guarantee about bandwidth etcetera etcetera it has to do some provisioning. So, it has to carry through this provisioning across this SDH uh, link which means uh, that it now, now if it is SDH that is not very difficult because depending on what speed what rate you want you just take the next higher. Uh, sized container. Okay. SDH as you know can uh, accommodate various types of containers like VC1, VC2 etcetera. So, it can contain various types of uh, containers, uh, various uh, rates etcetera. So, tributaries are possible. So, you take that kind of container so that you get a guarantee about the rate. So, that is how the uh, service provider I mean it may be in the infrastructure of the same service provider or it may be the infrastructure going into the infrastructure of some other service provider in which you could uh, sort of negotiate uh, 
uh, and uh, sort of configure the SDH switch so that this ATM stream will get this kind of bandwidth across the uh, SDH part of the backbone. So, you have this uh, link. Uh, so, virtual um, actually the ATM link, uh, I mean, I was I must uh, come to this um, that they can now go to the sonnet is contains a number of virtual paths okay. and each virtual path contains a number of virtual circuits. Okay. Mm, mm, so, for one particular pair of users is using one particular virtual circuit. So, that virtual circuit would be identified with a V c number uh, that is a virtual circuit identifier and a V p number that is a virtual path identifier. So, it is divided for uh, good management function. So, it is divided into virtual paths and virtual circuits uh, like this. So, this is the <coughs> basic concept and if you look at the details of the ATM header, ATM cell structure. So, one is the 48 uh, bytes of payload that is there and the 5 bytes of header this contains the um, so many uh, fields. One will look at the fields, but look at this VPI and the VCI. This is the virtual path identifier and the virtual circuit identifier. So, these uh, 16 uh, bits or 2 bytes for the virtual circuit identifier and uh, 8 uh, 1 byte or 8 bits for the virtual path identifier. Mm. So, the virtual path and the virtual circuit together will define this particular stream, this particular ATM stream may be coming from uh, that is this particular virtual circuit which is originating may be from some particular user somewhere all right. <coughs> so, that is this and then you have this HEC. So, let us look at the uh, details by the way this uh, this structure of the uh, cells uh, header is not constant across all interfaces. Okay. This GFC is there in UNI, but in NNI this GFC has been dropped and VPI uh, has been increased. So, here VPI is only 8 bits, here VPI is 12 bits and the expectation is that when you are doing network node interface maybe that is at the backbone with the service providers. So, lot of paths etcetera are coming. So, maybe you require more pa uh, more bits for uh, identifying the path. So, you have got 12 uh, um, path identi 12 bit of path identifier there and 12 bit of VCI identifier here. We have got 12 bit of VCI identifier here and only 8 bit of path identifier there. Okay. So, this uh, GFC the first one is generic flow control once again this was put there with some idea finally, uh, it uh, was not used much. Okay. So, actually these are 4 bits are for local flow control between the network access point typically a switch belonging to the network provider and one or more end stations. This is supposed to be used for multiple access for more than one station and for reducing the transmission rate etcetera for single node etcetera. This is hardly ever used. Uh, it is to do some local flow control at the um, LAN end between the switch and the uh, users. VPI is the virtual path identifier 8 bits, but since GFC is irrelevant within the network 12 bits are used. These may be thought of as the high order bits for the virtual channel identifier. A virtual path contains a number of virtual channels and the switches store per path parameters, so that individual channels do not need any signaling. Okay. So, this is the basic reason why uh, this um, whole thing that means the virtual one I mean one pair of users is using one channel all right <coughs> one uh, one virtual circuit. Now, this virtual circuit has to be identified and then it will be given some uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, bandwidth contract some kind of uh, class of service etcetera will be negotiated for this all right. Now, in a um, big ATM network actually um, thousands or even millions of circuits may be set up and torn, torn down at a very high rate okay, because at the service provider you know so many people are using it. So, millions of uh, switched circuit these virtual circuits may be set up and torn down um, um, and at a very short in a very short time. Now, for with e, I mean theoretically with each of these 
uh, virtual circuits we have some kind of quality of service parameters which have been negotiated, but these are sort of grouped together uh, for the similar kind of services uh, these virtual channels are put together. So, that these you need to store only for the paths okay. and similarly for uh, the um, for finding the for routing also these paths have some uh, implications. So, we are not going into that. Uh, so, that is why uh, some of these virtual circuits are put together to form virtual paths. So, we have uh, the VPI identifier which has the higher order bits of uh, um, specifying the channel and the lower order bits which is the VCI. Okay. However, if a virtual path is already set up and is scantily used this means wasted resources. So, dynamic renegotiation of VP capacity may be used. VCI is the virtual channel identifier 16 bits VC 1 0 through 15 are reserved for special purpose and others are for actual communication. <coughs> so, that is the this thing we have a PT which is the payload type uh, which is of 3 bits if high order bit is 0 second bit indicates congestion and third bit indicates end of AL 5 frame. Uh, etcetera. So, this is uh, just the payload type and CLP is the cell loss priority. Uh, so, the cell loss priority bit is used uh, by source for making priority uh, intermediate switches may mark it for violating agreements. For example, uh, if it is a CLP is equal to 0 or CLP depending on whether CLP equal to 0 or CLP equal to 1 uh, the cells may be uh, dropped or not dropped uh, in an intermediate switch. And HEC is a header checksum. This has a very important one thing is that of course, you can check whether the header has got an error. This has got some other function which we will talk about when we talk about the data link functions in ATM. So, the next uh, subtopic over here is the data link layer in ATM. <coughs> so, this uh, consists of the transmission control layer that means, each ATM cell if you uh, has a 5 byte header which the last field HEC is a checksum for just the header. The TC takes the cell from the ATM layer adds on an HEC and sends them as bit stream into the PMD on the transmission side. The bit streams may or may not have a separate transport. Now, on the receiving side the incoming bit streams are formed into cells and passed on to the ATM layer. Now, on the receiving side cell boundaries are to be detected. It also discards cells with invalid headers and uh, processes uh, this uh, for this management administration and management and control those cells OAM cells they are also uh, sort of uh, <coughs> handled over there. So, you see this is uh, one problem which came up because the uh, ATM uh, forum really wanted that this ATM should be deployed everywhere from the uh, backbone provider switch right down to the uh, user. So, that was the original idea. So, that is why the physical layer uh, nothing was nothing much was specified about the physical layer. So, since nothing much was specified about the physical layer uh, what happened was uh, what happens was that you cannot get any uh, kind of help in the synchronization through a particular type of coding etcetera etcetera. So, it can use any kind of coding it could use Manchester it could use some other kind of coding all right. So, that is uh, that you really cannot uh, dictate that uh, since you wanted to be neutral to the kind of physical medium through which it will pass. Since that happened now uh, it came into the, the this problem came up that you are getting a bit streams. Now, how do you know that where the cell is starting and where the uh, where is particular cell is ending. So, this is a problem <coughs> that is on the receiving side. In some cases of course, the underlying physical layer helps for example, when ATM cells are carried over sonnet or SDH the SPE this is you remember is the pointer in the sonnet header points to the first full cell. So, this so that you immediately know where it starts. In other cases every 40 bit sequence is tested for being a valid header and uh, the rightmost 8 bits will be valid HEC for the remaining 32 bits. So, uh, what is done is as I said that HEC has two function one is that it uh, sort of gives you um, some 
uh, a check a checking mechanism that whether the header is correct or not. The other is for this synchronization function which is that you a bit stream is coming. So, what you do is that now a header is 5 byte long 5 bytes means uh, 40 bits. So, if it is 40 bit long so you take 40 bits now if this 40 bit happens to be the header uh, what will happen is that the last <coughs> 8 bits will be the checksum will be a correct checksum assuming that the entire header has actually come correctly. So, the last 8 bits would be a checksum for the other 32 bits in the header. So, you check that if it is not maybe it is a header, but it came with a uh, with an error uh, we do not care the point is that we neglect it anyway we since there is an error you have to neglect it. So, you shift and take the next 40 bits and try to do the test again assuming that a header will come correctly and this uh, will succeed. Okay. So, we can uh, the TC goes through a hunt. So, this is the hunting phase and once it gets a header it knows that uh, so it gets into the pre-sync stage uh, <coughs> pre-synchronization. So, it has got one header, but of course uh, out of 40 bits with 8 bit bit uh, coming out as the checksum of the other 32 bits. So, the probability is there that this was not a header after all this was an user payload, but you uh, sort of um, wrongly um, interpreted this as a header because this uh, this part this 8 bit matched as the uh, checksum for the other 32 bit. So, what you do is that you go into the precinct stage if this is indeed the header a uh, this 5 bytes then the next 40 8 bytes would be data and the next 5 bytes would be again be a header. Okay. So, you continue checking this for some time in the, so this is the precinct stage and then when you have got this synchronization for some time you are reasonably sure that this cannot be a coincidence in the data given by the user we are indeed have locked on to the <coughs> header. So, now you know that you are synchronized all right. So, the TC goes through a hunt pre-sync and sync states to detect the cell boundaries. If a number of HECs are formed uh, found to be correct TC deems to have uh, found to be incorrect then TC deems to have lost synchronization. So, it has lost synchronization. So, it will have to resynchronize. This heuristic of course, defies the layered architecture because uh, the, uh, this layer you are doing the function of some other layer, but anyway does not it had to be done. So, this is a Mm, simple state diagram. So, you are you are in the hunting stage. So, at this stage you are looking at every 40 bits and trying to figure out whether this could be a possible header or not. Correct HEC detected takes you to the pressing stage. If it is uh, if you find that the next one is not you go back to the hunting stage. If you find a few consecutive correct HECs then you know that you are synchronized if you find a few consecutive incorrect HECs one HEC could be incorrect uh, that may be due to error, but uh, if a few consecutive incorrect HECs are there then the TC will uh, determine that it has lost synchronization. So, it will go back to the hunting phase. So, uh, we uh, sort of uh, stop here in this lecture in the next lecture as I said that we will be talking first about ATM addresses a little bit more in general then we will talk a little bit about ATM how ATM does its routing okay, and then how it handles some uh, 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 things like um, some uh, available bit rate etcetera how exactly is it handled inside. So, that is something we will uh, discuss and then finally, we will discuss that how this was sought to be married with the that means, if there is an uh, your software is in IP this is uh, if your network is in ATM how do will the whole thing work. Okay. Thank you. Good day. So, in the last lecture uh, we have uh, looked at ATM technology uh, in the box in the sense that uh, how it handles cells how it makes cells etcetera etcetera. Uh, uh, today uh, in the first uh, half of this lecture or first part of this lecture we will discuss ATM signaling and routing and uh, since uh, ethernet networks and other kinds of networks are ubiquitous uh, everywhere. Uh, so, if ATM is used in a backbone then how 
they would interoperate uh, uh, that means an IP network and an ATM network. We will uh, talk about that in the second part of this lecture. So, today we talk about ATM signaling, routing and LAN emulation. So, ATM connection types are of various types. The most predominant one are the switched virtual circuit for uh, which uh, where you set up a path and then take it down or permanent virtual circuit which is pre coded. There are other um, uh, connection types also for example, simple point to point connection, symmetric or asymmetric bandwidth connection, point to multi point connection data flow in one direction only or data is replicated by the network. So, this is an example of a point to multi point uh, network. Okay. Now, what happens when you do a, a ATM uh, connection setup? Well, um, you put up a setup signal. Uh, so, this may be this say this is the source and this is the destination, these are the intermediate switches. So, from the source there is a setup signal which goes to the intermediate switch which sends back some kind of acknowledgement saying that the call proceeding and put uh, sends the setup signal to the next hop and then the setup signal to the next hop. Okay. And each of them I mean immediately uh, they will uh, send back some kind of acknowledgement. And then when the call, call is accepted then a connect uh, signal will uh, start flowing in the other direction and when it reaches the uh, source then a connect acknowledgement will uh, flow and each of them will give this connect acknowledgement for this connect signal. And now of course, uh, the circuit has been set up or alternatively the, he can, the destination may reject it also then he just simply uh, sends a re uh, release kind of signal. And on the other hand when the, the circuit is this that is for circuit setting up and for taking down a circuit the source will send a release that means he has finished sending. So, he will send a release and release complete release release complete and so on it will go on and then finally, uh, the destination will uh, send a release all the way back. Uh, I mean the destination release could be initiated by the sender or the release could be initiated by the um, destination also. That means, if at some point of time destination thinks I have had enough mm. and then of course, uh, the connection gets terminated and release is complete. There is another approach to this which is not using lane, but uses classical IP over ATM. So, what is classical IP over ATM? The definitions for implementation of classical IP over ATM are described in RFC 1577. So, all the details are here. Once again over here we will just simply mention it very quickly. This RFC uh, considers only the application of a ATM as a direct replacement of the WARS local LAN segments connecting IP and stations which are the members and routers operating in the classical LAN based paradigm issues raised by MAC level bridging and LAN emulation are not uh, covered here. So, if you want to do classical IP over ATM you have to do address resolution and encapsulation these are the two issues to be considered here. Encapsulation consists of, uh, consists of putting appropriate ATM header trailer to a packet converting it to a number of cells and then sending them. So, this is encapsulation which means that you have got an ATM packet. So, this is a classical IP running over ATM you have got a big packet. Now, you know that in cells you have to break it up. So, you break it up and put a he proper header on each and then send them. ATM features are not utilized and internetwork traffic uh, handling is clunky. Okay. <laughs>